Hello everybody, it's Kara from Wild Book Garden, and today I'm here with part two of my March wrap-up. I will link part one down below, as well as content warnings, links mentioned, etc. And let's get into it, because it's going to be another long one. Um, next, I finished Aggressively Happy, A Realist's Guide to Believing in the Goodness of Life by Joy Marie Clarkson. Um, this is a nonfiction book that is pretty much about what you'd expect. Um, it's The author talks about how at one point somebody got upset with her for she doesn't even remember what it was, but like she was expressing like enjoyment in something and they criticized her for being aggressively happy. Like basically, how can you be happy when there are so many horrible things going on? Um, and it made her think about like, yeah, she is aggressively happy. And so this is kind of her uh, book about that. It's not really a memoir. I, I wouldn't call this a memoir, although there are some of those parts in this. Like she does talk about her own life. I have followed Joy Clarkson online for a while. I've read some of her other stuff, but I was really excited to read my first book from her. And I really liked this. This book is basically about like still having joy in the midst of everything that is going on in your life or in the world. Um, like there's different chapters that kind of there each chapter is kind of like a um, recommendation that she has or like a trick that she has um, about how to continue to be happy um, in the midst of all of this. And something that like I won't say I enjoy because I feel bad that she has this as well but something that I appreciate about this book is that because Joy Clarkson is coming from a place where like she also has anxiety um, which not that I'm glad she has it but like because she also has that perspective I think this book it rang more true to me it felt more grounded to me because it can be very frustrating sometimes to read um, things from people who don't experience that and it's like you just have to you know, get out there and be happy and decide to be happy and you will be because it completely overlooks the fact that for a lot of people that is not the reality. So it was nice kind of getting to see from a perspective of somebody who also struggles with those things, um, like being happy in the midst of those and in spite of those. Um, I do want to mention that there is a religious element to this, so do keep that in mind if that's um, a factor for you, but um, she's a theology student so she talks about that a lot um, and that is an important part of her life and yeah I really liked this overall. Um, I really liked her writing. Um, I think Joy Clarkson, like, she's really, she's really good at, like, especially the, I don't want to say abstract stuff, but she's a very beautiful writer, and I think that came through especially well in the parts where she's talking about these really big ideas and emotions. Um, like, I really connected to that, and she did a great job of describing these things that can be very indescribable. Um, I also like the way that this book is set up, so at the end of each chapter, um, there's like a, a page where she talks about some things that she recommends reading, seeing, listening, and pondering. Um, and I really like that in, for all of those there's at least one or two things that are very quick and easy to do. So maybe you don't have time to like watch a whole movie she suggests on this topic or like read a whole book or something, but like there'll be a painting that you can google or like a short song you can listen to or something like that. Um, so I liked that and I also thought those were really well chosen. Um, I also really emotionally connected to some parts of this book, like um, there's one chapter in particular that I essentially read, I guess twice, and it made me cry, unsurprisingly. Like it just really got to me very deeply and I felt very um, seen and known in some parts of that and I did really enjoy this. The, really like the only reason I gave it four stars instead of five is because like not every part got to me that way, which maybe is unfair because I think part of this too could be because of where I'm at right now, because of some things that are happening right now. Um, that it's a little harder for me to buy into some of her, like some some of her suggestions or some of her ideas about like happiness and being positive and like, I don't know, this is a very hopeful book and it's a hopeful book that acknowledges the hard stuff as well, which I really appreciate. And I wonder if at a different time in my life, I might be better able to accept all of the hope that she gives, if that makes sense. Um, but I really enjoyed this and I gave Aggressively Happy four stars. Next, I read Baraka Beats by Maliha Siddiqui. This is a contemporary novel. We are following our main character Nimra um, and for the first time she's going to be going to a public school instead of her private Islamic school um, and that's like obviously a big change for her but she is excited to be um, in school with her best friend for the first time um, who's non-Muslim. When she gets there um, her friend starts acting different. Um, she's not talking to Nimra, she doesn't seem to want to be around her anymore and so Nimra is really dealing with that. Um, she feels like she doesn't really have any friends there like she thought she would um, and then she kind of ends up getting an opportunity to join this group of kids um, who are in a band at their 
her school and she really likes these kids she likes spending time with them she wants to be friends with them and she likes being part of the band as well but she's conflicted as well because um, different Muslims have different um, beliefs and practices surrounding music and when or if or how um, you should use music and Nimra was raised to not do this kind of thing so she doesn't know what to do um, she doesn't want to you know go against this this value of hers and her family's um, but she also likes spending time with these kids she likes being part of the band and they're also doing a fundraiser to help refugees so she knows that this is an important thing that they're doing as well so she decides that she's just going to be the, in the band for long enough to win her best friend back because of course as soon as Nimra's in this popular band her friend starts paying attention to her again um, so she decides she's just going to be in there long enough and then uh, like to win her friend back and then she can stop doing it um, and that's kind of where the book goes and I thought this was so lovely I really loved Nimra as a main character I felt for her she's just I just really really loved her um, I also loved seeing how important Islam is to her like we see it as an active part of her life the author talks about how that was really important for her to show and I think that comes through beautifully in this book like we see what a meaningful um, part of her life this is for Nimra I also hated her best friend so much like I knew the premise of this one but I was still like so angry at the way she like treated Nimra like it just the book did a good job of communicating that because I really didn't like her um, I also really liked the new friendships she forms, um, a couple in particular. I also really loved this book's emphasis on the variety of ways that people can practice. Um, specifically in this case it's about different Muslims believing and practicing different things and in different ways and how that's okay and that you shouldn't judge someone for um, interpreting or practicing something differently from you. I just really liked that emphasis as well. Um, I just thought this was a really wonderful book. I do think there was a part of the ending that I would have liked to see set up better but I did still really love this and I gave Baraka Beats 4.5 stars. Next I finished Fruit of the Drunken Tree by Ingrid Rojas Contreras. I was one of the co-hosts for this round of Vaultathon. I will link the live show where we talk about this book and The Emperor's New Groove movie down below um, and this is a book that I like read because I was a co-host like I would not have picked this up by myself um, but this was a really interesting book so this is set in Bogota, Colombia um, during the time of Pablo Escobar and we are following two perspectives. Um, the main perspective we're following is this girl named Chula um, and her and her family are pretty wealthy very like very well off um, and the other perspective is a maid who starts working in their house named Petrona um, and the book is like the synopsis kind of describes like this friendship that's going to develop between them this connection they have these two girls who obviously have very different lives um, and it's like the rest of the book is really about um, like this the climate of the time like the political climate and the fear that people have the danger um, but also how people kind of try to keep living anyway um, and again a big emphasis is on these two girls and their different like upbringings and everything um, and yeah like this is I have a very mixed feelings about this book on the one hand I do think it is very clear that this is a very very personal and a very important book for the author to write um, like she talks about this in the author's note as well but like it is partly inspired by her own experiences and I think that you, you can tell that this is clearly a very like cathartic thing for her um, and it was really valuable to read this book and to get this perspective and to get a little bit of an understanding about what it was like to live in Colombia at this time um, and I think the book communicated that really really well like that feeling that fear um, the way that even though in a lot of ways Chula is very well off compared to Petrona how they both have these dangers around them but I also did not really have a great reading experience with this book um, I do want to mention I listened to the audio which is narrated by Marisol Ramirez and Almarine Guerra and I think both of them did a fantastic job I listened to this while reading along in a copy um, for my library and I think they did a fantastic job narrating it um, but like the actual experience of reading this book like was not great and not just because of the awful things that happened because obviously that's important to show those things it was just like I had some issues with the book as a story as well um like I was not a big fan of the writing I it's not really my kind of flowery writing um like there are authors you know like Anna Marie Macklemore whose um style I really love that tends to like lean more that way this book just felt like I don't know weird descriptions it didn't really make sense um like just kind of overwritten and clunky and I didn't like that um I also really didn't get any sense of a connection between Petrona and Chula. Um, like we were set up to expect I think their relationship to mean much more. Like I kept waiting for them to become friends and it wasn't until like half the book, two-thirds of the way into the book maybe, when something was said or something happened where I realized like oh I guess they're already friends like it just didn't feel very well developed and I feel like that was something that we were really supposed to see in this book that I didn't I also think the characterization wasn't that great like especially of the two main characters I just don't feel like they were especially like complex or well written there's also something that really rubbed me the wrong way like there's only one character in the book that we are told like specifically is black and the way they were characterized and described and just the way their character was like 
like the, the, their character's role in the story really bothered me like I it, it just stood out because this was the only character that we got that information for and then for their character to be written that way to be talked about that way to have that role in the story it just was a little uncomfortable um like I think there was some parts of the book that talked about colorism and that critiqued that which I liked but then the handling of this character um did not feel like it was done super well at least to me um there were things I liked about this book though I actually really liked Chula's mother and I thought that Chula's sister I think Cassandra was her name um she was really interesting as well so there were some side characters that I thought were more interesting um I also think the end of the book was done really really well there's like um there's a scene at the end especially that was I think just really really well done um and very effective like a few scenes actually um because this is not a spoiler because the book tells you this you know at the beginning that some big things happened between Chula and Petrona and that Chula and her family were able to get out of Colombia um and the Petrona is still there um so the stuff that happens at the end of the book I think was much more engaging was much better written was more thoughtful and like I said one of the things that I do just value most about this book is the important perspective like the fact that I did learn so much um so yeah this was like a really mixed bag so to kind of balance out all of these conflicting feelings um I gave Fruit of the Drunken Tree three stars next I finished my second ever Agatha Christie novel that was Death on the Nile by Agatha Christie which was a present from my lovely friend Hannah from Snow White Reader um and yeah after I read The Murder of Roger Ackroyd I was not a big fan of some of that story but I really liked the writing I thought her characterization was great I was definitely looking forward to reading more from Agatha Christie and I'm so glad I did because I really enjoyed this. Um, this is a Perot mystery and we meet a bunch of characters at the beginning who are all on this cruise down the Nile in Egypt and then one of them gets murdered and Perot is trying to solve the case. And like I said, I really liked this. Um, I think it's very understandable why Agatha Christie is such a beloved author because her writing and her characterization is just so impressive. Like the way that she can set up these characters and situations and the way that like she can introduce you to these characters who you don't know for very long but you already feel like you understand them you already care about them um there were a few characters here that like i really liked and i was like hoping you know nothing bad would happen to them like was definitely a possibility um and i also really liked perot here like i have seen some of the miniseries and i thought perot was fine but i actually really like him in the book like he's just very um it, he, charming like he's very like endearing and um thoughtful I just really like him and he he can be a little bit of a show-off but it's done in a way that is again kind of charming um so I, I just really liked him as well um I really liked the setting and like the setup for this like the bits that we get about like Egypt and like Egyptian um history and culture and everything um there was some like of its time elements regarding that but less than I expected so that was pretty that was positive I also really liked the premise and like this kind of kind of isolated close circle mystery, um, a phrase that I learned from Mara. <laughs> and yeah, I just really enjoyed this. Um, there were some parts of the solution that I had figured out, but I had like so many different theories and like suspicions that I'm not sure how many points I get for that. But I did figure some of it out, so that's kind of cool. Um, but I gave Death on the Nile four stars. Next, I finished Agnes Grey by Anne Bronte. This is um, another book that I have a live show that I was a guest on, um, so I'll link that down below. That was for Bronte Long. Um, and this is sadly Anne Bronte's only other novel, um, and I had not read this one before and I definitely understand why this is less popular with modern readers um it's much less obviously a subversive I think than the tenant of Wildfell Hall it is a very quiet story it's very slice of life in some ways and I can see why Agnes might not win readers over as easily as the main character of the other novel but I really enjoyed this um I think partly because I kind of knew what to expect going in like I knew that this wasn't as popular um I knew also that kind of the overall like premise or the plot and I also knew that the romance was very very subtle that that was not at all a focus of the book um, so I think those things helped set me up for a better experience with this um, but we are following our title character Agnes Grey um, and she decides near the beginning of the book to uh, be a governess that she wants to like do something on her own you know help out her family by making some money um, especially because they even though they they love her a lot and she has a very happy family life um, they never really expect her to do anything like this so off she goes and the first family that she stays with um is she's very disillusioned by her experiences there um like with the with the kids there and her trying to teach them and discipline them and make them understand um why what they're doing is wrong and she just she has a lot of her ideals challenged um and she does end up going to another family later on in the book and that experience is overall better but it is still again like very difficult very challenging for her um a lot of this book is about what it was like to be a governess at this time and how like they were treated as being like less than people in a lot of places like um like the way that they were looked down on and um like treated and 
just like the, the absurd expectations that people had of them. Like um, a lot of this book just does focus on the reality of being a governess in this time. And like I said, there is a romance subplot as well, although it is very subtle. And um, I just really enjoyed this. Like even more than I was hoping to. For one thing, I really love Anne Bronte's writing. It makes me really sad that she only has two novels, um, but it's just very clear and smooth. Um, I, I've heard her recommended as a good beginner classic author, and I think that is very true. I think her books are um, much more approachable than other classics can be. Um, I also really liked Agnes. I know that not everyone does, but I found her very relatable, and even though she does have flaws, she can be kind of judgmental. I still really loved her and in fact some of the times when she was judging people I'm like I would judge this person as well <laughs> kind of thing. Um, also her whole like I must not ever let my crush know I like them even if it means we can never be happy together because it would just be too embarrassing to admit to this feeling like that is very relatable as well um, so I connected to her there as well. Yeah like I just really enjoyed her I really felt for her. Um, I also am very impressed that this book is like a, a good chunk of the plot is like horrible children doing horrible things, which is one of my least favorite things to read about. And yeah, I still really liked this book. I think probably because I knew that at some point th those things would get better. Um, so that helped. And I also loved the love interest. Again, it is a very small part of the book. Um, I wish we could have seen more scenes with him, but I really, really loved him. And I really like how this book shows that, um, like, so obviously, I'm not the biggest fan of Jane Eyre, which is a different Bronte novel, but one of the things that I did actually like about Jane Eyre is the way it shows that um, plain people or ordinary people can still have these beautiful souls and these great love stories, and I think Agnes Grey does that as well. I think it does it even better, has the added bonus of not having Mr. Rochester in it, so um, if you like that aspect of uh, Jane Eyre, I think you would like that here as well. Um, again, it is a very quiet and character-focused story. I could see some people getting bored with it, um, but it is only about 200 pages. It's very short. Um, I also really like the commentary here, like again about what the life of a governess was actually like, um, not the romanticized version of it. Um, also some commentary on class. There's a character named Nancy who um, is one of the poor tenants on this, on this, the lands of this wealthy family that Agnes uh, goes to be a governess for. And I really like Nancy's character and I think it's so unusual in a classic of this time period to see a character like her who is written so compassionately and so complexly, I don't know if that's a word, um, but like to see her and Agnes have this true like friendship and the way that like Agnes can open up to her, the way that they can have these conversations um, about about like really like deep and important things like that's not often shown in like lower class characters in these classics and I really appreciate that we got that here. Um, like I said I really liked the romance even though I would have liked more from it and even though the commentary is not perfect like there's a few moments for example where um, Agnes thinks to herself like domestics have a tendency to uh, take on the faults of their betters and things like that like it's not like a perfect book in that regard. Um, I do think in a lot of ways it is very ahead of its time. Um, it also I think talks about um, like the the proper treatment of animals um, in a time period where as far as I remember this was kind of still like people were kind of transitioning to thinking of them more as like pets and companions um, that you would like love and take care of instead of just like tools or objects um, but I think at the time that this was published that was still kind of in the middle of happening like I think Anne Bronte was still kind of ahead of her time in that area um, so yeah like I, I feel like I just keep repeating that I understand why it's not as popular, but I did still really enjoy it. So even though Ten of Wildfell Hall is still my favorite of the two, I'm really glad I read Agnes Grey. I think I would enjoy it even more on a reread. Um, I also marked a bunch of quotes and favorite lines, so that's always a plus. Um, and I gave Agnes Grey four stars. And if you like missed your chance to read along with us, um, it is going to be a Pastic Classics pick in a few months here. Next I finished A Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry. This is a play and this was one of our Pastic Classics selections. We did two plays um, and Julia hosted that. I will link that live show down below. And this is a classic that I had never read before. Um, we follow a black family who um, end up coming into some money and the conflict that that, that causes over what they're going to do with it, um, whose dream they're going to fulfill with it. And I love this play so much. I totally see why it is a classic, why it is so well loved. Um, I, yeah, it's just, it's so good. I think the characterizations are fantastic. Um, we talk in that live show about how there's a few characters who are very frustrating, but we can see where they're coming from. Like even the characters who make like horrible decisions, you understand why they are in the situation they are or like why they, why they would make the choice they did. I was just so invested in this family and in wanting them to be okay. Um, I think the commentary on racism and classism is fantastic. I thought the writing was brilliant. Um, I think that this is a great example of 
a classic that is very timeless but it's also very timely and how those things are not mutually exclusive. Like I personally believe that one of the conditions of something being a classic is that it is very grounded in its time but that it is also very timeless at the same time and I like I think good stories in general do that and I think this one did that brilliantly because it is very set in this particular time I think in like 1950s in the US and the particular um kinds of racism or, or expressions of racism at that time especially in terms of like like housing and things like that but it is also very timeless like these characters and these issues still have relevance and one of the things I love in the introduction which this is also one of my favorite introductions to a classic I've ever read although I will say this really bothers me. Read it at the end of the play if you haven't read the play before because it spoils some things. I almost got spoiled before I even read the play because um, it, it just assumes you already know what's going to happen. But it is a fantastic introduction and one of the things it says is about how like even if and when we hopefully get to a point where racism is not such a problem in the US, um, this play is still going to be very relevant. Like these characters and their dreams and their wishes and the the complex family dynamics and all of these things are still going to be relevant, are still going to matter and move people. And um, yeah, I'm really glad I finally read this. I gave A Raisin in the Sun five stars. Next I finished Anthology of Amazing Women, Trailblazers Who Dared to be Different. And this is by uh, Sandra Lawrence, illustrated by Nathan Collins. Um, and this is one of those like, you know, multi feminist nonfiction books and I really love this one. Like I am never going to get tired of this publishing trend so I've read quite a few of these at this point but I still love them um, and I think this is one of the best I've read. I really really enjoyed it. Um, the book is divided into different sections um, so there's like women in art, women in history, women in politics, in science, in sports, uh, in music, film, and tv, in literature, in business. So women in all these different areas and um, the kinds of amazing things they accomplished and I really loved the variety here. I think um, I really appreciated how diverse the selection was um, in terms of uh, race and background and um, like country time period all of that. Um, I would have liked to see a few more like queer women included in this book because um, we don't have that many but overall I think the selection was fairly diverse. Um, I also really loved the illustration style. Let me see if I can show that off a little bit. Yeah just really loved that as well. I also appreciated that the book did a good job of um, like celebrating these women while also talking about how far we do have to go for gender equality. Um, I think those things are both very important. I think that um, the book did a good job of giving enough detail about these women but also not being too long. Like these are supposed to be kind of snapshots but I don't think they were so short that they felt really lacking, you know? Um, like there are, there are plenty of these women that I was really excited to look up more about and read more about but I still feel like I got a good kind of sense of who they were. Um, or at least like a good introductory sense, you know. Um, I also like that at the beginning of each section there's kind of a um, like mini write-ups on some of these women. So like for example, even though Artemisia Gentileschi doesn't get her whole full un entry, um, I do like that she and like other figures are talked about at the beginning kind of as a um, like a bonus, you know, like they're not the main featured ones but the book still talks about them. And then speaking of Artemisia, um, just on a personal note, I appreciate that um, there are quite a few women in here that I really admire, that I always enjoy reading more about, um, like Artemisia, like Frida Kahlo, Malala Yousafzai, um, including a couple who I really love but who I don't see featured in these kinds of books a lot, like Lea Salonga and Gurindo Chara, um, so that was really cool as well. I also learned about a lot of women I hadn't heard of before, um, so just a few of the standouts I wanted to mention. Elena Conaro Piscopia, um, who was the first woman to be awarded a PhD, um, which I can't believe I hadn't heard of her before, like that was in Italy. I don't remember which university it was but um, it was a it was in philosophy. I think it was like her bishop recommended her for the theology uh, degree but then when she got there the school was like oh no you're a woman we can't do that um, but she did still get a PhD like in philosophy which was very cool and something else that's interesting if infuriating um, is that the university that, that she went to it was like another I think three or four hundred years before they gave the second woman her PhD there um, which just goes to show that like the firsts are important but the like continuing history after that is also very important. Um, also Fanny Mendelssohn who I think I had heard of before but I didn't remember anything about her um, in a story that is very similar unfortunately to Mozart's sister. Um, Mendelssohn is a very famous composer and Fanny was incredibly talented but we don't really have any of her work anymore. Um, 
which is very frustrating. And then also Viola Desmond, who um, was Canadian and she was a black woman who refused to give up her seat in a theater that she had paid for. Um, like we learned about Rosa Parks in the US a lot, but we I don't remember us ever learning about uh, Viola Desmond. I do think there were a couple places where I would have liked the book to um, be a little clearer about the ways that some of these women were not always role mo models. Like they're interesting and they're important to talk about, but like how the fact that they accomplished things does not make them um, like a good person or an admirable person. But overall, I think the book did a pretty good job of uh, making that distinction. There were just a few times I think it could have done better. And overall, this book is weighted more towards like role model type women. Um, and yeah, I really loved this. I do want to note that because this was published in, I think, 2018, um, it does talk about J.K. Rowling and Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie because this was before they uh, announced their transphobia to the world. Um, so I, I don't think that's a fault of the book because of when this was published, but I did want to note that for readers. Um, but yeah, I thought this was fantastic. And they gave Anthology of Amazing Women five stars. Next I finished A Study in Sirens by Susanna Roundtree. This is a novella that is the next book in the Miss Sharp's Monsters series. I just forgot the name of it for a second. Um, so this is really short but it is between the first and the second novel and I really enjoyed this. It's very short so I don't want to say a lot about it um, but we are still following our main character Liz and there is a um, a body that turns up and it's about her and the inspector or detective from the first book um, trying to figure out who killed this person and um, it seems like there may be some monsters involved who in this world um, the royal families of like various houses in Europe are monsters um, so there's a lot of like commentary from this book on um, like on the nature of monstrousness and the way that uh, powerful men have always preyed on lower class people, especially women. Um, I just think that's done really well. Like I talked about for the first book that I think this is a great example of a premise that's really fun and interesting but that also um, has some depth to it so that continues here. I still love these characters and the writing and again the commentary so I give A Study in Sirens four stars. Next I finished Pride and Premeditation by Tears of Price. This is the first book in a companion series I think um, of Jane Austen murder mysteries. So this one is of course inspired by Pride and Prejudice um, and in this version of the story Lizzie works semi-officially um, in her father's law office, um, but of course she's not allowed to practice because she's a woman and Darcy is kind of a rival lawyer, sort of. In the beginning of the book, um, Mr. Hurst is murdered and Mr. Bingley is actually the suspect, um, but Lizzie doesn't think that he did it, Darcy doesn't either, and they end up grudgingly having to work together uh, to try and figure out who actually killed him and to um, save Mr. Bingley from getting convicted and executed. Um, and yeah, this was fun. This was like really interesting. Based on reviews I had heard, I knew this was going to be more of a loose retelling, kind of a loose historical basis as well. So I went into this more as like an AU or um, kind of like an alternate history almost, which I think was a good choice because um, there are some there's some time periods or like kinds of stories where I've read so many classics or like historical fictions that sometimes I can be distracted if there's like really glaring changes or mistakes or omissions, but because I knew this was going to be more of a light take on that, I think I was prepared, um, so I had fun with it. I thought the mystery was interesting and fun. I think the solution was more clever than I gave it credit for initially. Um, I think some of the characters were fun. I do think that Darcy and Lizzie are more loosely interpreted than maybe some retellings I've read, but I did like them together. I wish we had gotten more time with them actually. Um, one of my favorite scenes was when they're together in a records room, like that whole scene and, and conversation and everything I really liked. That was probably one of my favorite scenes in the book, so I wish we had gotten more from them, but I did like that. Um, I really liked Charlotte's character actually, and I wish that she had been in the book more as well. I also liked uh, Lizzie's realization of her own perspective and kind of privilege. Um, I thought that was done well. I do wish there had been more of an emphasis on like as I always, you know, I frequently talk about in books, um, I would have liked there to be an emphasis on Lizzie realizing that there is more than one way to be a strong and competent woman um, and that just because she doesn't like, um, you know, these things that she considers frivolous like balls and parties and um, all of that, it doesn't mean that they're unimportant. Like there was a little bit of that but not a lot. I feel like we could have gone a lot farther with that and I was expecting that to be more of a thing, like especially with the characterization of her mother. And I also think there were some parts of this book that like I appreciate that they weren't brushed over, but I still think the handling of that felt a little jarring. Um, and I don't really know how to explain it better than that, so that's not very helpful. But um, overall, I did like this. Like, there were parts that I wanted more from, but I had a good time with it, and I gave Pride and Premeditation 3.75 stars. Next, I finished Skin of the Sea by Natasha Bowen. This is a um, fantasy novel that is a very loose Little Mermaid retelling. I've never seen it marketed like that, 
but I think as the book goes on it becomes clearer and clearer that that's what it is, um, which I really enjoy. I don't think you have to know and love that original fairy tale in order to enjoy this, but if you are familiar with that it's fun to pick up on those little references. This is also a present from my wonderful friend Kelly from Cozy Reader Kelly, so thank you so much. Um, I also mentioned that this is one of those covers that is like even more stunning in person. So we're following our main character Simi Deli or Simi, um, and she is one of the Mami Wata. So these are um, mermaids who are African descended, and Simi's job along with the other Mami Wata is um, when the slave ships are, you know, carrying Africans away to be enslaved other places. Um, when, they, when the dead are thrown overboard, their job is to kind of like help their souls like move on and find rest. Um, and then one day a boy is thrown off a ship who is still alive and Simi saves his life, um, not realizing that this is dangerous for a certain reason. Um, and then when she finds that out, her and this boy uh, named Kola have to travel together in order to try and make amends for um, the rules that Simi unknowingly broke. And then they end up finding out more about this struggle, um, this like growing tension between some of the gods and trying to find um, balance, like to restore balance in the world. Um, and I really, really enjoyed this. Um, I really liked Simi as a character. I also think that her flashbacks were written so well. That's something that I'm a hard sell on, but I think they did a great job of us seeing her former life um, because before she was a Mamiwata, she was actually a human. And then like as she was dying, she was given the opportunity, like the choice to become one of the Mamiwata and she did, but it meant she lost all of her human memories, most of them at least. Um, and so seeing these flashes that she has of who she used to be, of her family, like I think they were done so well because we really get an immediate sense of what Simi has lost, so it makes her struggles with identity feel um, much more emotional and have much more of an impact. Um, I also really liked Kola, like especially like as the book went on. Like at first him and Simi don't really get along, but um, I really liked seeing them get to work together. I really loved their connection that starts developing between them, um, even though they're, it, it's a, a bad idea for a lot of reasons. Um, and I also was impressed because Simi, I think, starts, starts like noticing that she has this connection with him, that she likes him earlier than I tend to like, but I think it was done so well. Like I think it really makes sense um, why these characters would like connect so relatively quickly, not like too fast or anything, um, but I thought their relationship was done really well. Um, I really thought the world building like, and the setting and the religious aspects, including the deity characters, I think all of those were written so well. Um, and the ending of this book is just done really, really well, very effective. I am very ready for the sequel. I think this is just going to be a duology that comes out in a few months. Um, so yeah, I thought this was fantastic. I also think that thematically it does a lot of like really really interesting things. Like if you guys have read The Deep by River Solomon, um, this book is a different kind of take on that, but it also deals with um, ideas like memory and trauma and identity, and again it has that connection to um, like uh, enslaved Africans and like turning into mermaids and that kind of thing. Um, so they're very different books, I don't mean to like conflate them or anything, but this one also deals with some of those ideas and I really really enjoyed it. And I gave Skin of the Sea four stars. Next I finished a picture book that is Bear Tree and Little Wind, a story for Holy Week by Matali Perkins, illustrated by Koa Lee, um, and this is a story set during Holy Week. Um, I did read it a little early because I needed to return it to the library before then. So this is kind of um, talking about the story of Easter, like specifically like I said focusing on Holy Week, and also on the time after Easter, which I thought was interesting. Like it talks about Palm Sunday and like the lead up to Easter, and then about the time after that but not so much the holiday itself, which I just thought was interesting. Like that kind of surprised me. And I did really enjoy this. Um, the illustrations are beautiful. Um, I also thought it was a really interesting choice to have Little Wind like as kind of a narrator character. At first I wasn't sure how I felt about that choice, but as the book went on, I ended up really liking it. Um, and I think if you're looking for this kind of book, I did really enjoy this one. I do think this was a really good picture book and I gave Bear Tree and Little Wind four stars. Next I finished Clybourne Park by Bruce Norris. This is the second play that we read for Plastic Classics, um, so like the for the same month as A Raisin in the Sun. Um, again, live show is linked below, and this is kind of sort of a sequel. It's by a different playwright and it was um, written many years after A Raisin in the Sun, and this is like a very mixed experience with this. So I actually saw the play performed um, quite a few years ago and I thought it was fantastic. Um, and I think that gave me an advantage when we read the play because there were some things that I think seeing it performed really like added to the experience um, and you wouldn't necessarily get those if you just read this play. Like Julia and Taylor like really hated this play and I, <laughs> I get why, um, but I, I don't know, if I kind of average out my two experiences with this play, I guess it's like about a three stars or a three and a half stars um, because the, the performance was so good and I think there's reasons that seeing it performed 
is much more effective. Um, for context, I am not somebody who thinks that you have to see a play performed in order to get a feeling for it or if you would like it or understand it. It's actually very rare that I change my mind about a play after seeing it, um, but this is one of the exceptions. This is one of the plays where I think you really do need to see it in order to um, kind of get the full effect. Um, not that you would have to enjoy it if you saw it, I just think that seeing it is a much better indication of what the play is than reading it. Um, and I like there's just so many things that I think play better in a live performance like um, the cast I saw was incredible like they were really really talented and that obviously helps any play that you're seeing um, I also think that the the timing was really helped by seeing it live like um, Julia and Taylor both felt the play was like really long and slow to read I flew through it because when I had seen it performed the dialogue is so quick they picked up on their cues so quick that it really like the dialogue really flew by so I kind of went into this knowing that the dialogue was supposed to be fast um, which I think helped my experience I also think that the when I saw the play they talked about it being loosely connected not even loosely, connected to A Raisin in the Sun, but they didn't make a big deal out of it. So I didn't have that to compare it to, especially like because at that time I hadn't read the play A Raisin in the Sun either. Um, and then also when I saw the play, they performed it as a drama rather uh, rather than like a, a dark comedy or like a satire like this play is marketed as, which I don't think it is. I don't think it makes sense to call it that. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I don't know how I feel about this. So this play it follows two timelines and two groups of characters. The first timeline is set in the same time period as A Raisin in the Sun. So in the first half of the play, um, we're following this white family who, as the play goes on, you find out more about their backstory and what things they've gone through. Um, and then one of the big things that happens is like they're moving to another neighborhood um, and you find out, they find out from some other people that the family that bought their house um, is a black family and that they're moving into this like all-white neighborhood and that is, you know, of course causes consternation and all of this. Um, and then the second timeline is modern at the time that the play was written, so I think it was like 20... what, what year was that? 2011, I think, um, or around that time, and that is set in the same house, um, but decades later, and now this neighborhood has been traditionally, um, mostly African-American families for a while and now it's kind of being gentrified um, and that's kind of the the plot of like the second one again it's like a different set of characters but they are played by the same actors which causes some interesting parallels and uh, yeah as I was saying I think like seeing this play was really like I thought it was really good um, I think that a lot of things that make it work you really have to see because um, reading it I can see why that wouldn't be like as good of an experience but I didn't like hate reading it I think because I already knew that I had seen the play and really enjoyed it. One of the things that I think the play does well even though I like we talk about how it really could have gone much further with the commentary on racism and classism um, but one of the things that I think the play does do effectively is kind of highlight this like friendly racism um, like how even in like the the 50s timeline like nobody would admit that they were racist you know like they all agree that in theory black people should be able to live wherever they want but in practice of course they don't want an african-american family living in their neighborhood um so i think that was done well and i do think that um some of the emotional like parts that happen i think those also play better in like seeing it live versus reading it um but i had that leftover emotion like from remembering seeing it performed so i think that um, the emotional aspects felt more effective to me in the play. This is also an unusual play for me because I am a really hard sell on like concept plays. Um, like there's there's so many like modern plays especially that it's like yeah you had an idea you want to talk about why didn't you just write an essay you know? Because if you tell a story you have to tell a story. Like there have to be characters and emotional depth and um, like, a, like a plot and all of that. Um, and I think that this book is lighter on the plot and the characterization than I tend to like, but this is something, again, that was really helped by me seeing it live. I'm sorry to keep repeating that so much, but like that really does influence like a lot of my feelings on this play. So I'm gonna stop talking about it. I think I've communicated my point. Um, I guess I kind of gave this like a three or three and a half stars. Like I don't know how to summarize because um, I had very different experiences, like formats with this play. And um, I do think that the commentary, like this is by a white man, and I think that compared to A Raisin in the Sun, which is by a black woman, I think you can definitely, like he really could have gone a lot farther than he did. If you're gonna see one of these plays performed, please go see A Raisin in the Sun. Um, but I do think that there, there are some things that this play I think does do effectively. Um, and I, I think that seeing it performed like is a really great experience. Like 
I, I do think it can be a very effective play, but just not reading it by itself. Next, I finished Mechanica by Betsy Cornwell. This is a Cinderella retelling um, that is a fantasy and um, a little bit steampunk as well. Um, our main character, Nicolette, is an inventor. Um, her mother was before her, and that's like um, one of her main interests. That's the way that she's hoping to um, make enough money to get out from under her stepmother's thumb. And this is one of those books that is like almost more disappointing than a book I actively disliked, because this book could have been great, and it was just like very okay for me. Um, I, I do think other people could like this more than me, like some of this is personal preference, but it just ended up letting me down. Um, I will start with the things I liked though. I thought the fae aspects in this book were really interesting. I was not expecting that to be an element of the book. Um, I also think some of the side characters were really great. There's a mechanical horse that Nicolette has. Um, some of her friendships are interesting. Um, her like former it's like housekeeper who's half fae. He was probably one of my favorite characters. I really liked him. Um, I kind of wish he had been in the book more. And I also ended up liking Nicolette more as the book went on. Initially I wasn't like I didn't really connect to her. I didn't find her super interesting, but I liked her more as the story progressed and I also found the inventing aspect more interesting as the story progressed. Um, I think if you like that kind of thing you're gonna like that a lot more than me. Like inventions is not one of the hobbies I find super interesting to read about, but I do think that got more interesting as the book went. Um, and I think some of the takes on the Cinderella story are super clever, so I really enjoyed that. Other than that though, I was pretty disappointed. Um, this is a pretty short book and it read quickly, which I appreciate, especially because I was pretty bored <laughs> with like most of the story here. I also think the writing was not the best. Like there were some really really clunky transitions. There were multiple points where I had to go back and reread paragraphs several times to try and figure out how we had like why the main character had suddenly started thinking about this other thing. Like there are a couple places where it's like I still don't know if those things were actually connected or why we were like why we changed um, topics there. I also think the romance angle was not nearly as satisfying as it could have been and I'm gonna get into some kind of vague spoilers so I will put a timestamp down below if you don't want to know this but I feel like I kind of need to specify what I'm talking about. Um, so our main character um, starts thinking that she has a like a crush, like a romantic interest um, on one of these side characters. And I actually like really liked him. I really liked their scenes together. And I knew, this is one thing I'm like, I'm glad I knew from reviews kind of what was coming or I would have been, I think, more frustrated. Um, but I knew that that like aspect wasn't going to work out. So I was kind of like, why are you doing such a good job of convincing me that they would be good together? You know, like I really liked their scenes together. Um, but then at the end, when nothing comes of that, I, th I was actually pleasantly surprised by the way that was done. I think the book did a really good job of showing how um, like this wouldn't have worked after all. And, you know, seeing Nicolette realize that um, maybe this isn't the person for her and kind of seeing her start to begin the process of like getting over him. So I actually ended up really liking that. I'm like, this is great. What a pleasant turnaround. Um, and I also, I do really appreciate the um, ending of like not needing to have a romantic interest. So I get that. I get why some people would um, just love that no matter how it was done. I think that you can still have a romantic subplot while also having a very strong female character, but I do recognize why that would be like a nice refreshing change of pace for especially a Cinderella retelling, so I get that. Um, but then we get some kind of like setup for the character that Nicolette liked and um, somebody else, and like that was something that I think made a lot of sense as well. Like, I really liked their relationship, but then it's like the book is trying to convince you that, oh no, they wouldn't work out after all. But then it's like the book is trying to convince you that actually all three of them are in love maybe with each other, um, which I hear that in the sequel to this book that that is a lot more clear or like focused on. So maybe this series would be a good one to recommend for people looking for like an OT3 situation. Um, the end of this book just like barely hints at it. That's not like a huge focus or anything, but it just felt weird how like the book it seems like it couldn't make up its mind about which relationship it wanted us to root for. Um, and it just ended up feeling very lackluster, like very flat. Um, and that's kind of a good description of a lot of my feelings of this book actually, is that there were some things where even though I liked some of it, like for example, um, the friendships that Nicolette ends up making, I liked them, but they were also missing something. Like the characters themselves even recognize that they've barely known each other. Um, and yet they're like suddenly besties and how like kind of weird that is. They just didn't have that depth that I wanted. And there were like a few things like that where it's like, I like some of these ideas, but I wanted more from it, including like the magic, um, like the fey aspect and everything. Um, so yeah, this just ended up being like very mediocre, very middle of the road for me. And I gave Mechanica three stars. And then finally, the last book that I finished in March um, was sadly another kind of 
mediocre one for me. Uh, that was Bluebeard and the Outlaw by Tara Grace. This is another book in that Villains Ever After series I mentioned in my last wrap up. Um, and this is a combination Robin Hood and Bluebeard retelling, um, which I thought sounded really interesting. I thought the premise sounded really interesting because um, basically we're following um, our Robin Hood character who is a woman and she's kind of like the lead of her um, band of merry men who are in this version actually all her brothers. And they have been stealing, you know, the tax money and everything to give back to the poor for a while. But then Robin realizes that they have an opportunity for a much bigger score because they find out that the evil Duke guy, who is also known as Bluebeard, um, that he is looking for another wife, even though his last couple wives have died in very suspicious circumstances. Um, Robin thinks that if she can marry him, she gets access to all of his wealth and she can like pull off this heist and like defeat him for good. And I thought that premise sounded super interesting, but unfortunately the execution just really didn't do a lot for me. Um, I really don't have a lot to say about this one, shockingly, because I always have a lot to say about pretty much every book, um, but this was just like very okay. Um, I thought the Fae aspects were interesting. This was another book I didn't expect that element, but I thought that was interesting. Um, and I, I liked the, the idea, like the overall premise, but the way the story was written, I didn't like. I didn't really care for Robin as a character. I didn't care for Guy either. I didn't really care about their relationship either. I think other people would enjoy this one more and I wouldn't necessarily not try something from this author in the future. Um, I just think for this particular story, even though I was excited for the premise, I think the execution wasn't great for me, like in terms of characters, um, or even plot or like the writing or um, like the relationships and everything. It just fell very flat for me. So yeah, I gave Bluebeard and the Outlaw three stars. I just didn't really have strong feelings about any of it. It was just kind of there. <laughs> so those were the rest of the books that I read in March. Please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of these books, what you thought of them, or if you're going to pick them up. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you soon with another video and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye!